make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord? roaring with power and fighting our battle and every knee will bow before him our God is the Lamb the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chain and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb every knee Have a seat for a second. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're glad you're here today for uh, our encounter worship service. It's uh, been good to, to be together. You know, it's, it's a little bit of a letdown. I'll go ahead and tell you this. After Easter, we were so packed out. And then the Sunday after Easter, you're kind of like, eh, not as much. But hey, we're glad you're here. That's all that matters. And uh, those of you that are joining us online, we're grateful for you as well. We had about 370 folks here. Uh, between two services and online last week. So that's pretty exciting to see uh, more folks coming back. Uh, we're kind of getting past this COVID thing, and, and uh, it feels really good uh, to be together in, in the Lord's house. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. If you're visiting with us today, my name is David, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at, at Bullard First, and we're glad that you're joining us, and we consider you honored guests. If you, uh, uh, if you don't mind, stop by the welcome table on the way out. We have a little gift for you. Just to say thanks for coming today, and uh, we'd love to uh, for you to receive that as well. Um, Announcement-wise, well, before we do that, make sure to pass the baskets. That's our offering baskets on the end of each row. They're white baskets. Grab one of those, and then there is a, uh, a registration pew pad, if you want to call it, uh, that are on in the baskets as well. Make sure we get a registration of everybody's attendance this morning. It's a great communication piece for us. All right. 12.15 today, Board of Stewards meeting. Uh, if you are on the Board of Stewards, I certainly want to encourage you to come and be a part of that. Very important meeting. Uh, we've got some things that we need to be discussing. Also, uh, 4 o'clock today, we have a Club 118 and uh, Club m and &M that are meeting. Those are our elementary age uh, kids events uh, from the youngest to the through 5th uh, or 6th grade, I believe. Uh, and that goes from 4 o'clock today till 5.30. Uh, that'll be over in uh, Harper Hall, I believe, and uh, so be aware of that and uh, bring the kid on kiddos by. 
This week we will not be having our lectionary study on Tuesday. Uh, I've got an appointment I've got to be at, and uh, doctor appointment, and so uh, I won't be able to be there. And, but we will be having our Wednesday uh, Bible study, and we will be having confirmation classes on Wednesday uh, afternoons as well. We have a brand new mission barrel for us. Now, this is something different. Uh, we're usually taking care of two-legged uh, folks. Uh, we're now going to take care of some four-legged folks uh, through this month's mission barrel. Uh, the Texas Star Rescue takes, care, uh, takes animals from kill shelters in East Texas and Western Louisiana, and uh, they're in need of items. You'll find those in the yellow sheet on the announcement sheet. If you would, pick those up, and you can... Dog biscuits, treats, training pads, old towels, blankets, things that, uh, that might benefit the shelter. Uh, we're going to be a blessing to our four-legged friends uh, for this month. Just drop those off in the mission barrels that are uh, outside and by the welcome table when you come in. The youth are looking for pool hosts. Uh, they do pool youth in the summers where they go to different people's houses that have pools, uh, swim for a while, they eat. Have a, a little Bible study time together and, and uh, fellowship. And so if you have a pool and you are willing to uh, open that up so that the youth can come by, uh, please see Katie. Um, her phone number and email are on the yellow sheet, so be sure to pick that up. And then also, as we've been mentioning earlier, June 13th through 16th is VBS coming up. Save those dates. We're going to need everybody on board for helping with that. If you want to know more but find out ways that you can help, uh, talk to Miss Deirdre, and uh, she's our children's director, and you can give her a call. Her number is in the, uh, or well, it was in the one, uh, just call the church office, and we can get you her number if, it's, if you don't already have the uh, directory. All right, any other announcements? Anything I missed? If not, then let's stand and greet one another in the name of the Lord. You are 
Father, thank you so much that we get to be here this morning. God, we lift up your name in praise. You're worthy of it all. You deserve all the glory, all the honor. It belongs to you this morning. We lift you up. We cry out your name because we want you to be here with us, God. So stay in this place. Be in this place. We love you with all of our hearts. In your name I pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing with me as we read from this morning's scripture. It's uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive them their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so it is the Holy Spirit. So is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The story is told of a little boy who uh, was standing in the foyer of this very old church. Uh, that is one of those high steeple churches, been around for ages and ages, and, and uh, uh, in the foyer of this church was a, was a giant placard, and on that placard was all the, the men and women who had died in military service, listed their names, listed what wars, listed what years, and all those kinds of things, and the little boy was just standing out there, staring at it. And, and finally, one of the usher comes over and said, son, what, what you looking at there? He said, well, I'm looking at this board of all these, these names. What is this? And the usher says, well, these are all the, the, the folks that have died in the service. And the boy looks at it a little bit closer, and he goes, which one, the 9 o'clock or the 11 o'clock? <laughs> Ouch. For some churches, it's true. For there are such things as dead and dying churches. We all, as, a, as the body of Christ, have choices to make about what kind of church God has called us to have and what kind of church that we're going to be. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it, it, there's, there's three rules to... Uh, to interpretation and rule number one is context and rule number two is context and rule number three is context you got to take everything in context in fact a text without a context is just a proof text and a proof text is just an excuse for you to use God's word or a verse of words or two verses to mean whatever you want it to be and many people have done this they've taken things out of context and use them to justify uh, bad behavior or bad theology. It, it was for years, uh, different scripture passages were taken out of context and used to justify racism. And there are many other examples like that. So it's important when you're looking at a passage of scripture to always look at the context. Don't just take the one verse out and say, well, I'm going to make this say, because I've taken it away from everything else that gives it meaning and purpose, I'm going to make this say what I want it to say. Uh, here's the example why context is so important. Think of the, uh, uh, if, if, uh, uh, think of the words greenhouse, okay? Greenhouse. Now, what does that mean? Well, it, it could mean the house that's painted green. It could also mean the house that you, the glass house that's out in the back of the yard where you have plants in it. And it can also mean the house that Mr. and Mrs. Green live in. Do you see what I'm saying? How do we know what it means? It's got to be in context. And we've got to understand things in context. So uh, the context for this morning's passage is important for us to understand the magnitude of this morning's scripture. And so if you look back a little bit earlier in Acts chapter 5, you begin to see what was going on that led up 
to Peter and, and the apostles being brought before the Sanhedrin. In verse 12, we see that the apostles have been out performing many signs and many miracles. Jesus had given them authority to do so, and they went out, and it was amazing. Things were happening. Luke, who is the author of Acts, also the same Luke that is the author of the gospel, tells us that they were highly regarded by the people. Wherever they went, they had crowds that would follow them around. Uh, more and more people were becoming believers in Jesus Christ because of their preaching and because of their ministry. Uh, they would even bring sick people to the road where, where the apostles might pass by. In particular, for the, it, it notes in, in the Acts that, uh, that they wanted Peter's shadow to fall upon him uh, because it brought healing powers. I mean, that's amazing what work God was doing through the apostles at this time. And the high priests and the Sadducees were having none of it. They were not happy with this situation. As we've seen earlier in other places where the Pharisees, other religious leaders, were having none of it. They didn't like this. And, and now we see in particular a passage where it talks about the, the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were, uh, were the Jewish aristocrats, okay? This is the Jewish upper crust. This is the Jewish folks that were religious leaders uh, who had wealth, uh, and they were also from priestly families, and so they were the ones that were in charge of the temple. They were the ones that were in charge of the temple services. And they tolerated no threats to their wealth, to their position, or to their power. And they strongly opposed Jesus because they saw him as a threat. The Sadducees have Peter and the apostles arrested and thrown in jail. But during the night, Luke tells us in Acts, during the night an angel of the Lord appears to them and, and opens up the jail and ushers them out and tells them, he says, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. Go to, get out of here. I've opened the door. Get out of here. Go and tell people about Jesus. Go and tell people about life in Christ. Go and tell people and invite them to become a part of the body of Christ. And what do they do? They're out of there. They go. Well, Meanwhile, the next morning, uh, as, as the apostles are going off to, to, to preach in the temple, uh, we've got the Sanhedrin finally getting together that morning. And uh, the high priest calls them together. And uh, the Sanhedrin is the, the Jewish high council. It's the highest council of the Jews and the religious leaders. And it has, it's made up, of, Sanhedrin, it's made up of, of Sadducees and Pharisees and others. Okay, And the Sadducees had the largest uh, uh, amount. There are about 71 people that were in the Sanhedrin at this time. And, and once the Sanhedrin is called together, they send for Peter and the apostles. And guess what? They don't find them there. In fact, it tells us that the jail cell was locked and they were not in there. And so they're freaking out. They're kind of having this little crisis moment when all of a sudden somebody comes in from stage right and says, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. The men you put in jail are out doing something that you told them not to do. The captain of the guards then goes with some regiment of men to the temple uh, to bring them before the Sanhedrin. And he does it in a very cautious way. Uh, doesn't want to cause a stir because he knows that these folks are very well liked. And so uh, and he ushers them gently all the way back to where the Sanhedrin was meeting. And uh, there Peter and the apostles stand before the Sanhedrin, and this is where we pick up in today's passage. They're now standing before the Sanhedrin, and as you recall, uh, they're being reprimanded. Uh, in that passage, we heard how they're being reprimanded. Two things mainly that they're being reprimanded for. One is that they were teaching things that were not sanctioned by the Jewish religious leadership. You're talking about this Jesus guy. He's dead and gone. What are you doing? Why are you doing this, you know? And people are flocking to this. They didn't like it. They were also upset because the apostles were making it sound as if the, the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus. And Peter steps forward, and he doesn't back down. And he says very clearly, yes, you were part of the orchestration of Jesus' death. It is on your hands God is making a way 
for the Israelites to come to repentance and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You're guilty, yes, but God is making a way for the Israelites, or has made a way, really, uh, for the Israelites to come and, and, and that God might re- forgive them of their sins, they might repent of their sins. And then Peter says, listen, folks, we are witnesses to these things. Say that with me. We are witnesses to these things. Now, a quick sidebar on this point of the story. In uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 31, uh, it, Peter tells them that, uh, that it's Israel, uh, it, that God has come for Israel and Israel to repent and to, to believe. And, 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 and it sounds like this is one of those things. You could take it out of context if you don't look at it in context to the greater scriptures of the New Testament. Um, it sounds like God just came for the Jews. You know, he came for them to be repentant and them to, to come. No, no, no. This is, you got to understand, he's talking to a, uh, a Jewish audience. In fact, he's talking to the, the Jewish muckety-muck. He's talking to the big wigs of the Jewish religious uh, world. And so he's going to, of course, dress that with them. Uh, and, uh, and, and he doesn't want to bring in the fact that, guess what? God's not just here for you guys. He's here to save the world. He's here to save the Gentiles, those who, do not, who are not Jews. And he doesn't go into all that because he doesn't want to muddy the waters. He doesn't want to upset them further. He wants them to understand that God has come for them. Now, we know that, that uh, it's not just for the Jews that God has come. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that he, Jesus, died for all, not just the Jews, not just a select few, not just the frozen chosen. God died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but to him who died for them and was raised again. Now, last week, we kicked off this series, and uh, the series is called We Are witnesses we are witnesses and and we talked about how through God's word we are witnesses of Easter and how through God's son we become witnesses for Easter now the apostles as they stood before the Sanhedrin were both witnesses of Easter and being very much witnesses for Easter they had seen the risen Lord and because of the empty tomb their lives were changed forever and now nothing was going to stop them from doing that which God had called them to do to be witnesses for Easter for the risen Lord for the empty tomb for the salvation offered for the forgiveness of sins for the grace that is abundant nothing was going to stop them from being the voice and the hands and feet of God They had a story to tell. They had a story to tell to the nations, and nothing was going to get in the way of them doing it. But you see, the apostles really did, though, have a choice. They had a choice here. They had a choice to make. They could choose to obey the commands of the Sanhedrin and just go home and quit telling others about the empty tomb, quit telling others about the risen Lord, or they could stand up, And obey God and do that which God had called them to do. To witness to what God has done through Jesus' suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. And their choice was made very clear in our passage today. In verse 29 they said, we must obey God rather than human beings. Say that with me. We must obey God rather than human beings. Folks, every church has a choice to make. Every church has a choice to make. Do they obey God and be the church that God has called them to be and to do the things God has called them to do, or do they obey the opposition? Now, we don't have a Sanhedrin out there. We don't have the Pharisees and the Sadducees harping on us or anything like that. Uh, But we do have other things which work in opposition to, to our work to be witnesses both to and for the risen Lord. I mean, think about it. What stands in opposition to the church being God's witness in the world today? Well, there's the fear of what other people may think. You know, hey, if we get out there and we're bold for Jesus, uh, you know, somebody might talk about us. They might call us Jesus freaks, you know. What about uh, 
social pressures about what's acceptable and, and what's not acceptable. You know, the, the world doesn't like us to, to, to say things like, like Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They say, no, 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 Jesus is just a way. No, no, no. We believe that Jesus is the way, you know? They, they don't like things like that. They would rather preachers to preach things that tickle their ears and tickle their fancies and, 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 and are nice, warm, fuzzy Jesus. Jesus says, no, I want you to preach Christ and him crucified. I want you to preach the truth in grace, but I want you to preach the truth about the world and about what God is offering them. Another opposition that we face is our own comfort levels. You know, what are you, what are you comfortable with? Well, we tend to pat ourselves around, you know, with all things that are, that are comfortable and feel safe, and, 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 and so we want to do that. And I think there's the enemy out there who really, really wants you to do that, you know, and really kind of talks you into it, and you're like, well, I don't want to do anything that's going to make me feel uncomfortable. I don't want to do anything that's going to, uh, uh, you know, stretch me or, or challenge me or, or anything like that, you know, and, and, and God's sitting there saying, no, no, no. You're, you're a part of the church. I want you to be a part of the church. I, I, I've got some things I need you to do, but it's going to take you stepping out of your comfort zone. For some, the opposition to the church being God's witness is their own self-centeredness. You know, churches can be very self-centered places. They can be about their own personal agendas. They can be about, uh, uh, about taking care of themselves. I call them navel-gazing navel churches, you know. All they're doing is looking inward at their belly button. They're not looking outward to the people that are hurting, that are the least and the lost. They're not looking out beyond the four walls of their church because they're too busy having potlucks and, 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 and social gatherings. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with social gatherings or potlucks, but if that's all we did as a church, guess what? We would be on the list in the foyer of a dying church. We're called beyond ourselves we're called to reach out in mission and ministry. Sometimes the opposition is simply a fear of getting our hands dirty. You know, we don't want to get out. I might have to be around people I'm not comfortable with. You know, they might be of a different skin tone. Or they might have a different value system. Or they might have it from a different financial setting. Or, or they might be some people that, 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 you know, I don't have the same values as they do. Or, or lifestyle as they do. And they make me feel uncomfortable and and. and, and so many churches are not being who they're called to be because they're too busy feeling uncomfortable. And guess what? God sometimes wants us to feel uncomfortable so that we can get the gospel out there. You see, churches are called to bear witness to the empty tomb and the risen Lord, to reach out in mission and ministry, to serve in Jesus' name, to give of their time, talents, and treasures to the least, the last, and the lost, to make a difference in the world around them, to invite people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and into a life of discipleship, following after Jesus all the days of their life. We are called to fulfill the mission or the commission that God has given us in Matthew 28, to go and baptize uh, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded. And we can do that. We can obey God, or we can give in to the opposition. We can listen to those voices of fear, uh, listen to those voices of of worry or anxiety, listen to those, those outside influences and also the ones that are inside of us from our sin nature that simply says, no, just you don't need to worry about those people, you know. They'll, they'll find a church. It's okay. You just be your social club. You, you know, don't ruffle anyone's feathers, you know. Just, just take care of yourself. Take care of your own. Don't invite people to church. It's comfortable here dying on the vine the question for us as a church as a church body is who will we be and that question is before us every single day every single month every single year who are we going to be as a church and I think for the most part, this church has done a very good job of reaching out beyond itself. It's stretched itself in a lot of ways and challenged itself. And, and, and we've seen fruit from that. And we're really grateful for that. But guess what? It's not time to rest on our laurels. Because on any given Sunday, still yet, on any given Sunday, 
All the churches in Bullard and the surrounding area combined only reach about 10% of the population. On a Sunday morning, only about 10% of the population is in church. Folks, we got great work cut out for us. We're not in competition with the Baptists or the Church of Christ or anybody else. We're all on the same team. We're all playing for the same coach. And we're all going in the same direction. We need to continue to always be the church God has called us to be. And we should never let up. Never let up. Never give in to the opposition that says, just sit back. Just come to church on Sunday and sit in a pew or a chair. Don't, don't. Don't sign up to help out with anything. Don't, don't do anything with VBS. Don't do anything with, with uh, you know, don't, don't grow as a Christian. Just kind of come and be fed and become fat babies, you know, you know just drinking milk and, and instead, of, instead of eating the steak of God's word and, 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 and fulfilling that word by living it out on our every day. We are called to be a Holy Spirit-filled church. We are called to be empowered by God's Spirit to do these things. We are witnesses of these things, he says in verse 32. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. My prayer for us as a church is that we will be an obedient church. That we will reach out in mission and ministry. We will reach out to the least, the last, and the lost. We will take steps to make a difference in our community for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we will do it not on our own strength, not on our own power, but empowered by the Holy Spirit to go into the world and make disciples of all men and women and children and invite them all. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, sometimes I feel like I'm preaching to the choir on on these kinds of sermons, but but at the same time, you tell me to preach them. And I believe, Lord, it's because you want to remind us to, to never get soft. To never, uh, to, to never uh, lessen our focus. To never uh, get comfortable. But to always be looking for what's the next thing that you're calling us to so that we can be obedient as a church and fulfill your calling upon our lives. And so my prayer for us today, Father, is that we will always do that. We will never be comfortable where we are, but that we will always, as a church, reach out beyond ourselves as you have called us to do. So give us the boldness of Peter. Give us the confidence of the rest of those apostles give us your spirit to fulfill your calling in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit and all god's people said amen if you're here this morning god's moving your heart and life and you're ready to publicly profess your faith in jesus christ maybe you have some questions about that maybe you want to pray with someone about that i invite you to come find me after the service today i'd love to talk to you about that a little more make sure to understand what you're getting yourself into because it's a big change. It's a great adventure to be on. I want you to understand it. Uh, And uh, if that's you, come see me after the service today or come see me this week. Maybe you've already done that and maybe you've been coming to church for a little while now and you've really enjoyed things and, and, uh, and you're ready to be something more than just somebody sitting in the pew. You're ready to get active. You're ready to get involved. You're ready to help us be the church that we're called to be. But you're not really sure where to go, what to do, or how to get plugged in, come talk to me this week. I'd love to talk to you about the ministries of our church and give you opportunities for, uh, for where you can get plugged in and help you find some people that maybe uh, you can get joined up with and, and do some mission, do some ministry uh, together. And maybe you're here and you've already placed your faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe you're, maybe not, you're already plugged into mission and ministry of our church. But, but it's time now, God's saying, you know what, you need to make a commitment here. You need to, you need to uh, take a, you know, sign the dotted line, cross the line in the sand, whatever you want to call it. It's time to join and make that a faith commitment. 
I invite you to come see me after service today as well. Or talk to me this week. Uh, I'm very excited. I have a couple of couples that are that are talking with me about that right now. And hopefully we're going to see a response from them in the next uh, week or two. So anyway, let's stand together as we sing our closing song. uncomfortable because he's moving you out into mission into the world go in the power of the spirit to be the people God has called you to be us to be so we may change the world for the sake of Jesus Christ amen go in the peace of Christ